to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor and the broken heart and new life and for those who mourn heaven's child is born this is the gospel of christ are you sure that you're saved not asking did somebody tell you you were saved or do you feel like you're saved but are you sure that you're saved do you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you are right with God and that if your life comes to an end, you'll spend eternity in heaven with the Father? We can know. The good news is we can know that we are saved and that we are right with God. That's the whole reason God gave us this book, the Bible. 1 John 5 and verse 13, John writes and says, These things we've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know you have eternal life. And so, yes, the Scriptures teach that a person can be sure about his salvation and sure that his life is right with God. John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. As John gives us that theme statement to the Gospel of John, he says, "...in many other signs Jesus did in the presence of His disciples that are not written in this book." But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and believing you may have life in His name. You know, when Jesus spoke about truth, one of the things he wanted his hearers to know is that they could understand and know the truth and receive the benefits of it. Notice what Jesus said in John chapter 8 and verse 32. Jesus said, And you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. If I can know the truth, and that truth makes me free, then I can know then I'm free from sin and right with God. Paul said, I know whom I have believed in and am persuaded he's able to keep that which I've committed to him until that day. 2 Timothy 1 and verse 12. And so we ask you again, are you sure that if it all came to an end right now, you'd go to heaven, that you'd live with God? Friend, let's be sure. Life is very, very brief. James 4 verse 14, James says, what is your life? It's but a vapor, appears for a little while and then it vanishes away. It's like a shadow, Psalm 144 and verse 4. The psalmist said, our life is very brief, Psalm 89 and verse 47. And I love the words of 2 Samuel 14 and verse 14. Listen to the illustration David gives of what life is like. David says, for we will all surely die and notice the, this illustration, and become like water spilled on the ground, which cannot be gathered up again. Yet God does not take away life. He devises means so that His banished ones are not expelled from Him. What's life like? David said life is like a glass of water. You take that water and you slowly pour it out and the ground consumes it. You can't put it back in the glass again. We've got one chance. We've got one life. This is our opportunity, our one chance to get right with God and to go to heaven. And so we want to ask several questions today that we hope you'll think seriously about as we consider, are you sure? Are you sure, first of all, that you obeyed God's plan of salvation? There are only two ways to go. Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14, Jesus said, There is a wide and there is a broad way, and many are going down that path. And then there is a narrow or a restricted and difficult way, and Jesus said, Few there are who find it. There is a broad way that leads to hell, and there is a narrow or restricted way that leads to heaven, and there are only two choices. Now, friend, many people are going to say to you that all the various religions, all the various groups around today, it's like going to a buffet and you can pick and you can choose and you can do whatever you want and they're all going to lead you to heaven. Friend, the Bible just doesn't teach that. 
The Bible teaches Jesus is the way, one way, the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by Him. You know, the greatest question to ever ask was found in Acts chapter 16, verses 30 and 31. The Philippian jailer cried out, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Have you obeyed God's plan of salvation as the Philippian jailer did? We learn that to be saved, you've got to hear the Word of God. Romans 10, 17 says, Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Without that faith, it's impossible to please God. Hebrews 11 and verse 6. And so I've got to hear the Word of God because hearing produces faith, which is the second step in God's plan of salvation. Once I've heard this Word, then I've got to believe Jesus is the only way. Jesus said, unless... You believe that I am He, you will surely die in your sins. John chapter 8 and verse 24. Having accepted the fact that Jesus is the only way, the Savior of the world, you then must be willing to repent. Jesus Himself said in Luke 13, 3, Unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Have you turned from sin to living for God? Have you made that good confession? Matthew chapter 10, verse 32 and 33, Jesus said, If you won't confess me before men, neither will I confess you before my Father who is in heaven. If you will confess me before men, I'll also confess you before the Father who is in heaven. Have you made that confession that the Ethiopian eunuch made? I believe Jesus is the Christ the Son of the living God, Acts 8, verse 36 and 37. And then, have you followed all that up by being immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins? We'll say more about this in just a moment, but suffice it to say, Jesus taught in Mark 16, 16, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. Jesus taught both belief and baptism were essential to salvation. Did you obey that plan of salvation? Are you sure that you've obeyed it God's way? And then we might ask this question. Are you sure if you did do all those things, are you sure you are baptized properly? And here's what we mean by that. In the Christian world, and we lose, use that term very loosely, in the Christian world, there are three modes people will say are sometimes acceptable as baptism. Some people will say, well, as a baby, you can be sprinkled, you can have a little water poured on you, or you could be immersed. The question we want to ask is, which one does God approve of? As you think about the act of baptism found in the New Testament, only one of those is seen as approved by God. You will not find sprinkling as an approved act of uh, baptism. You won't find pouring, but here's what you do find. There are four passages which clearly teach baptism must be done by full body immersion. Mark chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, people often ask the question, what would Jesus do? Well, let's ask that concerning the mode of baptism. At Jesus' baptism, what mode did he use? The Bible tells us of the baptism of Jesus and coming up out of the water, the Spirit descended upon him like a dove. What mode did Jesus use? Well, let's ask this. What do you have to do to come up out of water? Well, naturally, you have to go down into water. Jesus was immersed. Acts chapter 8, verses 37 through 39. Both Philip and the eunuch, they both got down out of the chariot. They both went down into the water. He baptized him, and they came up out of the water. Again, if sprinkling or pouring were necessary, why did they both have to get out? Why did they both have to go down into the water? Why did they both have to come up out of the water? There's another clear picture of baptism being immersion. But then there are two other passages I would ask you to think about. I want you to notice the words of John chapter 3 and verse 23. Here's a very incidental, very important passage as it relates to baptism being immersion. The Bible says in John 3, 23, Now John also was baptizing in Aenon near Salim, watch this, because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized. Why does the Bible tell us John was baptizing where there was much water? One has to ask that question. And friend, it doesn't take much water for sprinkling, and it doesn't take much water for pouring, but if God's approved method of baptism is immersion for a grown adult, that requires much water. 
Now think about another passage. Romans chapter 6 verses 1 through 4 is one of the clearest pictures of baptism being immersion. The Bible says this, John or Jesus says, Paul says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? Now notice this. Therefore we were buried with Him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Did you notice that reference that Paul uses there for baptism? Baptism is a burial. At a burial, you don't sprinkle a little dirt on the water, on a person. You don't pour a little dirt on them. You completely cover them in dirt. If baptism is a burial, friend, then baptism must be by immersion. And so we ask you, are you sure you were baptized the right way? And then we might ask this question, are you sure you were baptized for the right reason or purpose? There are a host of people in the religious world today who teach that baptism is nothing more than an outward sign that you're already saved. Something good to do, something Jesus did, but not essential for salvation. You can do it maybe two weeks after you're saved, kind of to show others you're now a follower of Christ. Friend, you just don't find that in the Bible. What are the purposes of baptism in the Bible? Well, let's look and see what those are. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, we notice this purpose for baptism. The Bible says, then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What was the purpose when, when Peter preached that first gospel sermon? What was the purpose of baptism? It wasn't an outward sign of inward grace. It wasn't something to show to others they were being identified with Christ. It was for meaning looking toward or the goal, the purpose of the remission of sins. Now someone says, are, are you saying baptism is the point at which sins are washed away? Did you know that's exactly what we learn in Acts 22 verse 16? You remember that, that persecutor of the church by the name of Saul? Saul is confronted by Jesus in Acts chapter 9. And he's told to go into the city and it'll be told you what you must do. And Ananias now comes to Saul of Tarsus in Acts twenty two sixteen, 16. And he says, Saul, Saul, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and listen and wash away your sins calling on the name of the Lord. Baptism is for the forgiveness of one's past sins. It, it is essential because it is the point at which sin is removed. Baptism is for salvation. You know, a lot of people say, well, the Bible never says baptism saves. Friend, that's not true. In fact, the Bible explicitly says baptism saves. Notice the words of 1 Peter 3 and verse 21. The scripture says... There is also an antitype, don't miss this, which now saves us. Baptism. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We ask you today, does the Bible say baptism now saves us? And friend, it clearly does. That's what Jesus was teaching. Mark 16, 16, when Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. Jesus clearly taught baptism was essential to salvation. Well, someone may say, well, all those passages may sound good and well, but I don't have to be baptized to go to heaven. Did you know the Bible explicitly says you do? Look in your Bible in John chapter 3, and I want you to notice what the Bible teaches us in John chapter 3, verses 3 through 5. The scripture says, Jesus answered to Nicodemus, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now Nicodemus is confused and he said to Jesus, How can a man be born when he's old? How can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot 
enter the kingdom of God. That kingdom of God, which is the heaven on earth, which one day will be those in heaven, is essential to me being a part of God's family. And if I want to go to heaven, I've got to be a part of God's kingdom now. And how do I get in that? I am born by Water. The act of baptism is the action that puts me into the family, the kingdom of God, which will spend eternity in heaven. But let's think about another purpose of baptism. Did you know baptism is also essential to get into Christ? Now, to understand the importance of that, we look in Ephesians 1 verse 3. The Bible says all spiritual blessings are in Christ Jesus. If all spiritual blessings are in Christ, and if according to 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verses 11 through 12, salvation is in Christ. All spiritual blessings are in Christ. Salvation is in Christ. Well, the next question one want to ask would be, how do I get into Christ? How do I access all spiritual blessings? How do I access salvation, which is in Christ? Notice the words of Galatians 3 and verse 27. The Bible clearly says, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. The only way in Scripture that a person gets into Christ is through baptism. Did you know baptism is what puts us into the church of the Lord Jesus Christ? In Acts chapter 2, they were told, Repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. Those who gladly received His word and were baptized, that text tells us the Lord added those who were being saved to the church. Acts 2 and verse 47. In fact, it's 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13 that teaches us by one spirit we're all baptized into one body. How do I get in the one body? Through baptism and thus it is how we obey God's plan of salvation. Well someone says, doesn't the Bible say that all you've got to do to be saved is call on the name of the Lord? There's no doubt there are passages that teach we must call on the name of the Lord. Acts 2 verse 21, Peter as he proclaims that first gospel sermon quotes from the Old Testament prophets and says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Well, how do you call on the name of the Lord? I want you to notice again the conversion of Saul. It clearly tells us how to call on the name of the Lord. The Bible says in Acts 22 and verse 16, Ananias says to Saul, And now, why are you waiting? Watch this. Arise, be baptized, wash away your sins. Here it is. Calling on the name of the Lord. You know, if we let the Bible be its own best commentary, we learn how to call on the name of the Lord. I get up and obey God, which includes being immersed in water for the forgiveness of my sins. And so baptism is essential to salvation. And so we ask you again, are you sure you were baptized for the right reason? Friend, your soul is way too important and way too precious to trust on men's words and men's ideas. And then we might ask, are you sure you repented of sin? Even if a person has obeyed the gospel, that doesn't secure his salvation eternally. He must continue to live faithfully to God, which includes from time to time, as he recognizes sin in his own life, being willing to repent of it. Jesus clearly taught the importance of repentance. Luke chapter 13, verses 1 through 5, there are certain people who came to Jesus and it looks like they want to condemn others. What about these people who had their blood mingled with their sacrifice? What about these 18 people who are walking down the road and a tower falls on them and kills them? They, in essence, are asking Jesus, wasn't that the vengeance of God on those people? Here's what Jesus said in verse 3 and verse 5. Unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Jesus, in essence, said to those pious Jews, stop looking around at others, stop nitpicking at other people's lives, and if you're going to be saved, you've got to repent, you've got to change, and I've got to make my ways pleasing to God. What is repentance? Repentance is really a two-part process. It's very simple. It is a changed will that leads to a changed way. Matthew 21, verses 28 through 30, Jesus illustrates this. Father had two sons, and he said to his first son, Son, go work in my field today. Son said he would, never did. Then he said to his second son, Son, go work in my field today. The second son said, No, I will not. He changed his way of thinking, 
and then he went and worked in the Father's vineyard. And Jesus said, which of those two did the will of the Father? Well, they said the, the latter. Why? He changed his will, and then he changed his way. That's what repentance is. I, I change my will, I change my way of thinking to God's way of thinking, and then I change my way of acting to the way God wants me to act. I want you to notice the words of Peter as he preaches the gospel in Solomon's portico in Jerusalem in Acts 3 verse 19. Notice what he here says. Peter preached, Repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Repent and be converted or some versions say turn again. Luke 3 verse 6 we know that repentance is also a changed way of life. For John the Immerser, as he saw some of the Jewish elite coming out to be baptized just because everybody else was doing it, here's what he said. You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? And then he said this, bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. Can I identify repentance in a person's life? Absolutely. How so? You can look at their life and they no longer talk the way they used to talk. They no longer act the way they used to act. They're no longer involved in things that maybe they were once involved in. Their whole life has changed by their allegiance unto Jesus Christ. And then we might ask you this. Are you sure you're a member of the Lord's church? There are a host of religious groups started by men alive today. But are you sure you're a part of the church Jesus built? In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus asked his disciples, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Well, they gave a great compliment to Jeremiah or others, uh, the prophets, the, these great men. And Jesus said, Well, who do you say that I am? Peter spoke up and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, Flesh and blood's not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And he says to Peter, Based on that statement, based on this rock, I'm going to build my church. Notice what Jesus said about that church in Matthew 16, verse 18. Jesus said this, The Bible says, I say to you, Jesus speaking, that you are Peter on this rock, the fact that I am the Christ, the Son, the living God, I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Whose church did Jesus build? Well, Jesus said, I will build my church. Well, how many churches did Jesus build? Jesus said, I will build my church. Well, who does the church belong to? Jesus said, it's mine. I'm going to build it. Friend, if Jesus built His church and the church is singular and the rock, the fact that Jesus is the Christ, is the foundation singular also, there is only one church. God never, it was never in the mind of God and is not pleasing to God that a host of denominations exist today. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, the Bible says, He is the head of the church, which is His body. Jesus is the head of the church, and I want you to notice, the church is also called the body. Now what do we learn about that body? In Ephesians 4, verse 4, we're taught this. There is one Lord, one faith, and there's also one body. Now think about this. If Jesus is the head of the church, which is His body, and there's only one body, how many churches are there? Just one. That's all God ever intended to build. Are you sure you're a part of the church Jesus built that He died for? Acts 20 verse 28, the Bible says, Jesus purchased the church with His own blood. Are you a part of that purchased, called out group? Friend, be sure denominationalism was never the will of God and is contrary to everything Jesus tried to do. Jesus, as He knows He's about to go to the cross, prays in John 17, 20 and 21, I pray, Father, that they all may be one. As you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they all may be one in us, that the world may believe you sent me. If Jesus prayed for oneness, does denominationalism look like we're trying to achieve that? Psalm 133 and verse 1, the Bible says, Behold how good... And how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And then if all those things, you say to yourself, I've done this, I'm, I've obeyed God's plan of salvation, I was immersed for the remission of my sins, I am a member of the one church Jesus died for, 
then we might ask you this. Are you sure you're putting God first in your life? Friend, it's going to be a sad day on the day of judgment when members of the Lord's body didn't fully give themselves to His cause. Here's what Jesus asked. Notice the words of Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33. Jesus said, But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Are you sure that you're seeking first? That it's your main priority? It's what comes first on your list of things to do? It's at the top of everything, your energy, your time, your money, your effort? Is God's kingdom the most important thing in your life? I know it was to Paul. Paul said in Philippians 1.21, For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Paul had already crucified the old self. I've been crucified with Christ, he said. No longer I who live, Christ who lives in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Are you really putting first things first? Friend, I want you to think about the question Jesus asked in Mark 8, verse 36 and 37. Jesus asked, What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul, or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? My soul, and friend, your precious soul, is way too important to let it slip by without asking these questions. And so we ask you to think seriously again. Are you sure? We're not asking, did someone tell you you were? We're not asking, what did your mom or daddy do? We're not asking, what do you feel? But are you sure? based on the truth of God's Word, that you're saved and that you're living the way you ought to. Remember Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. You can be sure. And friend, what a joyous feeling it is to know if all fails today, if the world comes to an end, if the Lord comes back, if I die in this life, I'm sure I'd go to heaven right now. If you don't have that knowledge, then friend, we invite you to obey the gospel of Christ before it's eternally too late. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the gospel through TV, radio, and internet. Our motto is to take the whole gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905, or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.